the bank is one of those bidders. They have like an auctioneer. Uh, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like the Texas guy who's talking real fast, but um, they do have someone who is in in charge of the auction. Yes. All right. All right. I'm going to do my best to not touch the mic this time because that was a pain to edit. Um, all right. So you just bought a foreclosed property. I did. So I thought it'd be interesting to dig into that from an investor's perspective, not necessarily your particular property, but foreclosures in general. I don't have a ton of experiences I was telling you other than what I read on the internet. I know you have a you have a ton of experience in foreclosures, so I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions and go where we go. All right, so let's start with what is a foreclosure? Okay, so a foreclosure is a house that has been foreclosed on. Okay, so then you ask, well, what does it mean for a house to be foreclosed on? When someone buys a home and they get a loan to do so, they are most people say getting a mortgage, uh, strictly speaking, legally, they are giving a mortgage to the bank. So the lender is the mortgagor, or sorry, the buyer is the mortgagor, they give the mortgage. The lender is the mortgagee, they receive the mortgage. And that is in exchange for the money that they have lent on the house, right? So the lender gives the money and the borrower receives the money. Okay. Or in this case, the title company receives the money and disperses it to the seller. Um, but when a person is buying a home and they're not able to pay all cash for it, and so they get, go and get a loan, when they finance the property, they are giving the bank a mortgage. And in the event that they are not able to pay, the bank uses the mortgage as the security instrument that was pledged uh, or that, that pledged the house as collateral for the loan to go through the legal process of foreclosure. So it is a legal process whereby they're able to then take possession of the house. The owner former becomes the former owner. The borrower becomes the former owner. They no longer own the home. Title is given over to the lender, the bank, uh, and the bank now owns the home. So they were not paid back the money that they lent out. And so they receive the house back in exchange after going through the process of foreclosure. So it's a it's a legal process meant to get the lender their money back. Right. And so they receive the house back because the house was pledged as collateral for the loan. And then by selling the house. Hopefully uh, they get their money back. Right. In the bank size, hopefully they get their money back. Right. There was a time when that was not the case. Right. So from like 2000 and depending on the market you were in, 2007, 8 through 2013, 14, banks were foreclosing on homes and receiving far less in return than what they had lent out. Right. Which is why you had so many banks go under or get taken over by other larger banks or bailed out by the federal government. So extrapolate on that a bit. So what was the talk us through the kind of fundamentals of why that happened? Obviously okay. people were getting loans they couldn't actually afford. Correct. And so the main the main reason that the real estate boom and bust happened in the early to mid and then late 2000s into the early 2010s. Um, but the, the crisis point was in 2007, 2008. So in the early 2000s, there was a huge run up in real estate values, um, much faster appreciation than you would have seen historically, much faster appreciation than was truly warranted by economic fundamentals. Okay, so how did it happen or why did it happen? It happened because several years prior, the federal government basically said to banks, you need to start lending money to groups of people who have historically been underrepresented in home ownership. We're going we're to help people get out of poverty and build wealth and 
something like that. Um, and so the federal government basically put uh, a gun to the bank's heads and said, you have to start lending more to these underrepresented communities. Okay, so that started the process of enlarging the credit box. Okay. So as the credit box began to grow and more funds were available to purchase homes, prices began to rise. At the same time, as prices were rising, uh, non-traditional entities, so um, different types of investors entered the market in order to buy mortgage-backed securities, right? So a loan or group of loans is originated, uh, those are then resold into the secondary market. Uh, they're packaged as a bundle. They have certain characteristics. The investor is relying on the seller's representation of those characteristics in order to rate the product and purchase it at a certain price. And those underlying fundamentals were misrepresented. So there was kind of a frenzy of buying from investors. Uh, as the investor demand increased, the credit box increased further or enlarged further so that the standards for lending uh, became more and more loose or lax, such to the point that you ended up having loans, uh, we used to call them the ninja loans, no income, no assets, no job, uh, literally a stated income type product, uh, and even worse than that really, where there was no requirement for documentation from the borrower. So that it was just a game of financial musical chairs where eventually the music stopped and some people were left holding the bag and banks were left holding the bag. But as the credit box increased um, and more credit was available, it continued to drive the price appreciation. You could hardly even call it appreciation because at that point there was a tremendous amount of speculation, right? So not just investment, but pure speculation um, where investors are not looking at market fundamentals or potential improvements in order to realize a reasonable return. Um, it's just, just going to go up. It, it's just gambling, right? It, it's not. Uh, it's not investing. It was just gambling. And so eventually, uh, the credit box could not get any larger. There were almost literally no buyers left. And so at the end, when there were no buyers left. The Ponzi scheme, and it was literally a Ponzi scheme. So if you're, if you're familiar with the Ponzi scheme, it's where the later investors are paying the earlier investors, right? So Bernie Madoff was famously convicted for this, right? Where he had an investment fund where he got people in, and then he got more people in, and they used the people who got in later to pay the people who got in earlier, and on and on it goes um, until eventually you can't get new investors and the money dries up and it all collapses, right? So that's exactly what happened in in the real estate market. And so eventually when then when there were no more buyers, sellers didn't have someone to buy their homes. Um and because that situation was so widespread in the economy, because so many people had had an interest in, I was going to say had their tentacles in, but it was even average people who were not doing things um, maliciously because so many people had an interest in these mortgage-backed securities. And so they were invested in so many different places. Uh, the drop in property values um, and the cascading defaults caused a financial crisis, which rippled not just through the American economy, but literally through the world. Uh, through the world economy. And so prices continually fell and fell and fell and fell and fell for a, for a period of, you know, five or six years. Um, and that that's the Great Recession. What was the, um, there, was a, there was a bailout stimulus attached to that at some point, right? Do you remember the number for that? Oh, man, I don't. Uh, it was a, a huge amount of money. Was it larger than the recent $2 trillion? Uh, I don't believe so, no. It was in the hundreds of billions. But I don't think it actually passed a trillion dollars. Yeah, so put that in perspective. Like hundreds of billions is a lot of money. But to think about the scrutiny that came with that stimulus bill versus the two trillion we just passed like that. Yeah, and that's kind of a shame because with the bank bailouts, it was hard to justify that. Now it was justified in the sense that 
uh, or I'm saying, I'm not saying I believe it was justified. I'm saying people justified it. People justified it by saying there's a systemic risk wherein if banks collapse, the economy will likewise collapse. And not only Wall Street, but Main Street will also be decimated by this. And so in order to prevent that from happening, we need to pump liquidity into the banking system in order to keep it working, to in order to make sure that people still have faith in the banking system so that uh, you don't run on the bank. That and to make sure that people still have confidence to just go out and, and buy and sell and to transact and to do business. Um, the problem, of course, is that however well-intentioned it might have been, uh, there's a law of unintended consequences and the government came in, they passed this stimulus, uh, bailed out the banks, then they came in and did Dodd-Frank, which was a whole series of financial regulations uh, that in essence was based around the idea that banks ought not to be too big to fail. So it put certain parameters and regulations in place to require banks to be well better capitalized, um, to better manage risk, and to not put the whole financial system at risk again by virtue of their mismanagement. Unfortunately, what ended up happening was that the big banks ended up continuing to grow because the financial regulation was so onerous that it put... Uh, yes, and the financial regulations were so onerous that they, the cost of compliance put a lot of smaller institutions out of business. So a lot of the smaller banks and even uh, a lot of private lenders ended up going out of business as a result of it. So you ended up with banks that are still, in essence, too big to fail. It's, it's fascinating to think, you know, how do you go from a well-intended initiative to get people out of poverty and into homes to this like spiraling, you know, systemic problem? Like that's the part I'm, like all these smart people got in a room, figured this thing out, but nobody, nobody said, "Hey, what's what? Uh, what are we doing?" Or maybe there was, but you just don't hear about them, you know. Well, <laughs> depends on who you're referring to as the smart people. If it's the politicians, maybe not. I mean, it, it sounds good, right? Um, you look at the numbers, and you say, "Okay, homeowners, generally speaking, have more wealth than non-homeowners than renters." Therefore, we ought to encourage home ownership. Assuming that home ownership in and of itself is the vehicle to wealth creation. There's something to be said for that, but there's also something to be said for the fact that people who own homes also have a certain set of personal, moral, financial characteristics that enable them to own a home. It's hard. It's hard for the government to regulate personal you know, decisions, right? Who's who's moral and who's not, right? Well, and and who has financial understanding and and um, and self control, self discipline, right? And so, uh, if you're going to buy a home, then in theory, in the past, you would have had to have been disciplined enough to save up a decent amount of money to be able to afford the down payment for the purchase of a home. Um, and so in order to encourage more home ownership, the government has created a number of federally backed programs, which are low to no down payment programs. And so you can go out and buy a home with very little money. Well, if you have not saved up very much money, that could be for a variety of reasons. It could be because you just are very bad at managing your personal finances and end up spending more than you make. Or you don't make a lot or you have a lot of other debt. Or you could just be very young and starting off and there's nothing blameworthy about that at all. You're just young. You haven't had enough time to save up as much as other people. Um, but again, it, it, it saw home ownership in and of itself as the vehicle for creating wealth. And it is a good vehicle for, for creating wealth, right? We don't want to diminish that because if you can pay $900 a month for rent versus $900 a month for your mortgage payment after 30 years, if you're renting, you're still paying $900 a month in rent. In, you know, in reality, you're paying more because of inflation. But that $900 a month mortgage payment, you, if you've got a fixed rate, uh, fixed interest rate, that nine hundred dollar mortgage payments staying pretty steady. Now it's going to fluctuate a little bit. It's going to go up a little bit because of taxes and insurance. 
But by and large, that's going to stay pretty steady. Whereas over 30 years, your $900 rent could go to $1,300, $1,400, $1,500. Your mortgage payment wouldn't really increase by more than $100 or $200 over that time. So the overall cost of housing is less for the homeowner because they have that fixed interest rate. Um, but also after 30 years, Again, assuming wise financial management, right? You're not endlessly refinancing your house and taking on, you know, pulling out cash and pulling out cash and pulling out cash. But if you've paid it off after 30 years, then not only have you saved over the 30 years because your payment is steadier, uh, less volatile, but also after the end of the 30 years, you don't have that payment anymore, whereas the renter still has that payment. Okay. Not only that, but having paid off that mortgage, now you have an asset, which is your home which is unencumbered, and you've got probably a couple hundred thousand dollars of equity in that house, and there's your wealth. So again, we have talked a lot about how real estate is a great vehicle for, for building wealth, but you have to take all of those factors into consideration. Um, and obviously the government didn't do that. You know what they should do? They should come out with a, a loan for, for new people and they're looking to buy their first home and t attach it to just house hacking. Take take the FHA loan and say you could you can't just buy a single family home. You need to buy an actual income producing property. You got to live in it. Yeah, I mean it's a Tom Holland loan, <laughs> right? Well, Tom Holland got the FHA, you know, owner occupied multifamily loan, so there is that option. It would have been very different though if you know that. Taking the FHA loan and buying a single family home and just paying down, you know, the balance on it is very different than buying a multifamily property, mm -hmm. living on one side and having somebody else help you pay down the balance. You know, it's it's very different when you do the math. All right, so that was a big detour. So the foreclosure process is a legal process intended to deal with people who aren't paying their loan, basically. So once you dig down into that, it seems to break down into a couple of different, I don't know what you call them, stages or phases, right? What are those phases? Well, so in Florida, you have uh, the very first document that is filed in the foreclosure process is called the lease pendants, L-I-S, two words, L-I-S, P-E-N-D-E-N-S, lease pendants. So the bank goes and files a lease pendants. It is the public notice that the borrower is in default. They're not making their payments. Uh, and then after that, that's the first document that appears in public records. So uh, until that happens, you don't really know if someone is not paying. But once you see the lease pendants, you know, okay, assuming that they don't write this ship pretty quickly, um, depending on the volume of foreclosures going through the court system, somewhere between, you know, nine and, well, I mean, it could be anywhere between six to nine, or in the case of the, the Great Recession, you know, 36 to 48 months down the line, this person will eventually be evicted from their home and the bank will take over possession. Um, three, three to nine months? Um, so after the lease pendants, which is normally filed three to six months after the borrower's in default, which I didn't mention at first. So borrower stops making payments three to six months later, generally lease pendants is filed. After that, there's the court process of, um, you know, the attorney representing the bank filing all the documentation showing that the borrower hasn't paid, which eventually will culminate in a uh, final summary judgment where the bank is awarded uh they win the court case essentially the judge says okay yes you are the mortgage holder you have a right to foreclose you have standing to sue this homeowner and take the house back and you know, you've provided the facts in the case and yes we agree that those are the facts that is correct the homeowner's not paying uh you know you Mr. Chase Bank or Mr. Bank of America or whomever, you know, are the mortgage holder, you're allowed to foreclose. And so we are going to give you possession of the property. And then they say, based on 
how much was outstanding at the time of default, plus the accrued interest, plus expenses you've incurred to do this whole foreclosure. Um, this is the amount you're owed, and that's the final summary judgment. That final summary judgment will typically take place anywhere from nine-ish, six to 12 months um, after the lease pendants is filed, anywhere between six to nine, maybe 12 months after that, all the way up to 36 to 48 months after that. Now, today, it would not take 36 to 48 months, right? That was that was at the height of the foreclosure crisis. There's just so much work right. to deal with. Exactly. Well, and there was so much buying and selling of these mortgages that the banks were not keeping a very good paper trail. And so they were not able to prove that they were the mortgage holder and had standing to foreclose. So that was a big problem. And that's why people were able to stay in their homes for so long, even though they weren't paying. Well, even, tw even you know, a year of not paying your mortgage seems like a long time. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, and I, I know one gentleman who, by virtue of a couple uh, legal tricks, um, was able to stay in his house for like seven years without paying, um, which was pretty wild. But that's not the norm. Even at the height of the foreclosure price, uh, crisis, from the time you stopped paying to the time you were evicted from the home was like three to four years at the max. Nowadays, it would be nine to 12 months after you stopped paying. So you have the final summary judgment of foreclosure. In the final summary judgment of foreclosure, there will be a court date set or a, sorry, an auction date set wherein the property will be auctioned off and that's the foreclosure auction when you hear someone say a foreclosure auction that's what that is so typically a month to three months after the final summary judgment there'll be that auction now it used to be that that was at the courthouse and you had to go and visit in person and anyone could bid and you're basically saying you know this is how much i'm willing to buy the property for right the bank is one of those bidders they have like an auctioneer uh yeah yeah it wasn't like the texas guy who's talking real fast but um they do have someone who's in in charge of the auction yes and and people are bidding you know so the bank is one of those bidders and the bank is owed whatever the amount is in the final summary judgment right now that may be less than the property's worth in in uh, the case of a property that was foreclosed on today that would likely be the case back then the final summary judgment might have been for twice what the property was actually worth right and so local investors would go and try and bid and the bank would have an idea in their mind of what the property was worth and so they would bid up to a certain amount and if one of those investors was willing to pay more than that they would bid up and you know they would win and they would take uh possession of the property uh, take title to the property after the foreclosure auction. Now, in order to do that, they had to be able to pay cash, which is why a lot of people can't. The average Joe is not able to buy a property at a foreclosure auction because you have to bring the money to the clerk of court and then they will record the certificate of title saying you own it. The reason you have to have cash to do that is because no bank is going to lend you money on a property that you don't yet own, right? They're not going to hand you a check for tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars so that you can then take it down to the clerk of court and they give you the ship of your title before their mortgage is ever recorded, right? So that's not going to happen. So foreclosure is a is a cash buying game even today? Um, the foreclosure auction is, the yes. Auction. Yeah, the foreclosure auction is. Now that has trans, uh, transitioned to an online platform which has uh, disadvantaged local investors and has advantaged out of town investors, and especially in places like Tallahassee, because you know people from Miami, Orlando, Jacksonville, Atlanta, um, metropolitan areas that have wealthier people than we have here locally are able to bid online rather than having to come and bid in person. Right in the past, a guy from Miami wasn't going to drive up here for a foreclosure auction; it just wasn't going to happen. But he can hop on his computer now from anywhere. And he can bid on these foreclosure auctions. So it's not as um, it's not as good of a buying opportunity as it used to be because there's a much larger pool of investors uh, who are willing to buy these properties and buy them at lower margins because they're often buying in bulk. And so 
again, it's just disadvantaged local investors. Um, but so we've gone from lease pendants to final summary judgment to courthouse auction. Where is that online platform before you move on? Okay, so it's on the uh, Leon County Clerk of Courts website, uh, which I think is www.clerk. Uh, leon.fl.us. So it's an actual local website. Uh, and then you can go and click on, there's a link for uh, foreclosures or foreclosure auctions or something, and it'll take you to the the uh, platform. And there are instructions on how to do it and all that. I was assuming it'd be like some consolidated platform, but every county is probably going to have their own. Uh, run by the clerk of court. Now there is a common software underlying that that i've seen across multiple counties so you're going to kind of get there from the local clerk of court who's going to manage the input of that information and everything you know this is our calendar this is when our local judges have awarded the final summary judgment and this is the auction date and you know so they're managing this platform with the underlying software which is common across municipalities at least in florida as best i can tell <clears throat> so again, lease pendants, final summary judgment, foreclosure auction. Now, if the bank takes the property back at the foreclosure auction, they're issued a certificate of title. That's when they take ownership. And then at some time after that, usually a couple months, they will list the property for sale with a real estate broker local to the property. Um, oftentimes, people will see in the uh, public record in the uh, property purchase website an amount for which the property was purchased. A lot of times, well, almost all the time when the bank takes it back, all you'll see is a hundred dollars. What that means is no one else bid. The bank put in a bid, the lowest possible bid, which was a hundred bucks, and they just took it back. It was uncontested. No one else was interested. But a lot of times it'll get bid up and you'll see the bank taking it back for $40,000 $80,000, $100,000, whatever the number is, wherein they bid and no one else was willing to outbid them and they take it back. Is there ever a situation where the bank won't bid? Uh, there's not a situation where the bank won't bid at all, but there is a point where they feel like, okay, hey, you know, our if our final summary judgment was for a certain amount of money and we're getting in excess of that, Right, because if a local investor, uh, if the final summary judgment was for X dollars, and a local investor bids up to two X, then the bank's like, "Hey, great, you know, we got, we're covered, we're good." Um, and so there will come a point where they're just willing to let the property be, you know, bid out to another investor. Um, but we've got. You know, we've walked through that whole process. I won't repeat it again, but eventually the property will come back or come on the market for sale if it's not purchased by an investor or potentially a homeowner at the foreclosure auction. How does the bank determine who to list the property with once they take it back? Uh, so there are in any in any location, usually a handful of real estate brokers who have put in the time to take the necessary coursework, do the necessary um, hand shaking, elbow rubbing, um, in person is meetings. This a, is this a relationship thing or is this like a, a formal go through this process and you're on our list of people that you can? Um, it used to be more uh, networking. Mm -hmm person to person relationship based uh it is now more you know are you willing to jump through our hoops to do this training are you willing to take the lowest possible commission are you willing to pay us a referral fee that type of thing okay so so the foreclosure process it sounds like is basically broken into pre foreclosure auction post foreclosure right so if I'm an investor, I guess you can take advantage of of any of those three stages. Well, there's not much you can do pre-foreclosure unless you are able to contact the owner directly and enter into an agreement to buy the property from them. If you're doing that, then you're going to have to either work with them to 
work with their bank to do what's called a short sale or pay them enough to pay off that mortgage. Now, if they're getting foreclosed on, but they owe half of what the property is worth, then a savvy investor may be able to pick it up on the cheap and turn around and resell it quickly and make a lot of money. But if that person were wise, if the person being foreclosed on were wise and they had a lot of equity, then rather than allowing themselves to be foreclosed on or selling it cheap, exactly, rather than selling it cheap to a local investor, just contact your realtor and list it for full market value and pay off your loan and walk away with whatever equity you still have. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, let me hit record on that. I don't know, thinking they're miraculously going to catch up on payments and they end up getting all the way to the end of that, you know, 12 months or whatever time frame it is. And now it's too late to. Yeah, well, there are a lot of reasons. Yeah, there, of course, you know, if you're in a situation like that, there can be a lot of shame associated with it, right? So there are people who just won't want to tell anyone that they're in that situation and won't want to reach out for help. And those are the folks who end up, you know, leaving a lot of equity potentially on the table um, and walking away from a property that they might have sold and and realized a decent profit. Um, but there could also be people who just aren't particularly financially savvy and don't understand their options, uh, which is why, again, it's important to have a good realtor that you trust and who you're willing to be frank and open and honest with and maintain a relationship with uh, so that you can reach out to them in, in times like this. Uh, but if you are upside down on it, you could pursue a short sale rather than letting it go back to foreclosure. That would help to mitigate the financial consequences of that situation. Um it would be less damaging to one's credit to go ahead and get it sold via short sale relatively early in the default process rather than continue to not make payments for an extended period of time and let that inflict more damage on your credit history and then have the foreclosure on your credit history instead of just a short sale. Um, but yeah, I, there are a lot of intricacies to each person's situation. Have you ever helped somebody look for a short sale opportunity? Yeah, most people are not interested in doing that unless they're investors because most people have a time frame in which they need to buy. There's an end date. You know, it's baby's going to be born or, you know, I'm moving to this area or school starting or my lease is up or whatever. And the timeline on a short sale is unpredictable, right? Ideally, if you have a good agent who's experienced, who's done a lot of the legwork on the front end, uh, you can get a short sale approval in four to six weeks. But then you still got to do your inspections and close the loan. So from contract to closing is no longer 30 days. It's 75 days or 90 days or 120 days potentially. And so because that's uncertain, you'll get to a point in your search process where you just no longer have the time to abide that uncertainty. You just can't take the risk. You put in a contract and you know you need to be at your lease in 45 days. You don't have enough time to wait on a short sale. It's just not going to happen. So a lot of buyers shy away from them in, in part for that reason and in part because they don't want to be tied up to something that they don't even know for sure they're going to get because the bank could come back and say, no, we're not willing to do the short sale at the price at which you're willing to buy. And so they've wasted all that time. And in the meantime, there are other properties that perhaps they liked as much or better that they have lost out on. So most people aren't saying, hey, yeah, let me, you know, let's go look for a short sale. Um, investors will do that because they don't have the time constraint. Uh, but most homeowners, uh, prospective homeowners are not super eager to be looking for short sales. So if I'm an investor and for some reason I want to look for these opportunities and I came to you, how would you go about finding a short sale opportunity? Well, the best way, the most transparent way to find short sale opportunities is to comb the lease pendants records and to just regularly search for new lease pendants because that's someone who is in default. And again, depending on the economic circumstance, may or may not be upside down on their house. But if they're missing payments and, again, they haven't put it on the market and said, let me just sell and get out from this situation, 
in all likelihood, they don't have a lot of equity, right? It may be someone who um, did one of the low down payment loans, right? Who did 100% financing with USDA or VA or 3.5% down with FHA. And so they don't have a lot of equity. And by the time they were to pay brokerage fees and doc stamps on the deed and tax probation, they'd end up bringing a lot of money to closing, which they can't do because they can't even make their mortgage payments. So how are they going to bring $10,000 to closing? So you're really scraping, you're really digging deep for short sales. Mm -hmm. Like you might be able to, so the, the lease pendants records are public. So you go search through all that stuff. But the ones that you find is going to be a really low percentage of the ones that you could actually do a deal on. Yeah, and someone may very well say, okay, sure, you know, I'm willing to do the short sale uh, because I'm just going to keep living here and not making my payments until that happens, and they're fine with that. Uh, other people may want to ride it out as long as they possibly can because they're in a financial situation that necessitates it, you know. Okay, yeah, the short sale could get done in six months. That's great, but if I ride this out, I get nine or 12 months, and I need the extra three or six months until I can get back on my feet. So... Being on the lookout for short sales is, it's it would definitely be a numbers game, but it is a you know pretty low uh, percentage numbers game. There's that. That would be kind of the the first stage, right? If you're looking for properties in that early stage of default, then there's of course the foreclosure auction where you could buy there if you have the wherewithal to do so, if you've got the cash available. And then after that, post foreclosure. Um, you're mostly working through the ordinary channels like you would for any other home that's for sale. So most of the time it's going to be, well, with foreclosures, 95% of the time it's going to be listed with a local real estate broker. Um, the other 5% of the time it might be listed on one of the major auction platforms. So auction.com or something like that. Okay. It goes through the, the MLS too, right? Most of the time, yes. Most of the time a local broker will put an MLS and then say, you know, subject to auction terms, see XYZ website, you know, auction.com or Hubzoo or one of the other big ones. So, okay. So if, if I'm an investor, I want to find a property post foreclosure. I'm just working with a realtor essentially at that point. Right. And when it goes, so when it goes to the MLS, are you tagging it foreclosed property? Like how do you, there is a that? correct. Yeah. And so under sale type in our local MLS, uh, there is an option for foreclosure and that doesn't mean that every time a listing agent inputs a property that's bank owned, they're going to check that box. The overwhelming majority of the time they are. And so you could search for that criteria and just be on the lookout for foreclosures. I have a couple investors who have that exact search set up, you know, Leon County bank owned. That's their whole search. So everything bank owned that comes on the market in Leon County, boom, they get a notification. So after that point, kind of the evaluate from an investor's perspective, the evaluation of that property is really the same as, as any other property. Um, what about financing? Does financing differ? So long as the property is in reasonably good condition, no. If it's in a significant state of disrepair, then it's either bad enough that you're paying cash or doing some type of renovation loan, but that wouldn't be altogether different from a house which wasn't in foreclosure that was just in serious disrepair. It just so happens that, generally speaking, homes that are in terrible disrepair are also foreclosures. Now, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's an estate property. You know, someone lived in there until they were very, very old. They didn't have any you know, local family. Um, the property was allowed to deteriorate. They didn't keep up with the maintenance. Then it was a lengthy probate process. And, you know, 10 years later, the property hasn't been maintained at all. And it's in serious disrepair. That happens. But most of the time, homes that are in really, really bad shape are ones that are foreclosures. Why is that? I mean, I, beyond the obvious, people can't pay the mortgage, so... They're not fixing the house. But, but if you look, if you sit in the house, even for a year, mm -hmm. and don't do anything to the house, mm -hmm. how bad could it actually get? It depends in part on how bad it was when you bought it. And that was part of the problem in the, in the real estate bust was that people were paying inflated prices for properties that weren't in especially good shape. And so then all of a sudden that 20-year-old roof and that 20 year old AC break start leaking and you just lost your job 
and you don't have any equity in your house. So what do you do? You live there as long as you can until those conditions become unbearable and then you leave. And so if the property is vacant now, utilities are off, which is in this part of Florida, I mean, mostly any part of Florida, but our, our part of Florida in particular, because of the, the climate that we have combined with the type of construction that we have means that most homes in Tallahassee, when they are not heated and cooled constantly, will start to fall apart really fast. Get moldy. And- exactly. And so if you imagine the situation where, you know, that happens, the leaks, uh, the roof is leaking, the AC is not working, the utilities are off, and it takes three years for a bank to foreclose on a house. It's basically outside at that point. Right. And so the house is, you know, it is falling apart in, in that much time. So, okay, so who determines, I guess the bank determines if it's in terrible shape and they're like, I'm not going to do a normal loan for that or... Well, the ultimately that falls to the appraiser who is contracted by the bank. But the appraiser has his guidelines based on each specific loan type. Each loan type is going to have... Uh, there's their general basic standards, safe, sound, sanitary. So those are the three key factors that an appraiser is looking for. But um, different loan types will have some different characteristics that they're looking for or physical physical characteristics that they're looking for, like a VA loan. A VA loan requires a clear wood destroying organisms inspection. That's the only loan type that absolutely requires it, right? So if you have an older home that's got wood rot and you can't get it all for some reason. You can't get a clear WDO. Well, then you're not going to get a VA loan on that property. But it's it, that falls to the appraiser. And for non-foreclosure properties, almost all of them nowadays are going to be conventionally financeable, you know, without some type of renovation loan product. But if it's bad enough that it wouldn't qualify for one of those traditional loan types without significant improvements, then you just end up doing a, a renovation loan. Could a property ever, could a property be in such bad shape? It Like, would it ever, would a, would a bank ever list a foreclosed property if it was in a certain, is there any state that the property could be in where the bank wouldn't list it as a foreclosed property? Like if it, a fire burnt down a house, could it still get through and get listed? It would still get listed. It would just be valued differently, right? If it's in such disrepair that essentially at that point it's a teardown, then you're listing it for lot value instead of for improved value. So you're saying, okay, the land's worth 50 and it's going to take someone 10 grand to come bulldoze all this. So we're going to list it for 40. Okay, so where are the opportunities? Are there any um, specific type of foreclosed properties or certain situations that are more opportunistic for investors than others? Or they all kind of have to go through the same evaluation process? Well, so some bank-owned properties will have an owner-occupant period tied to them. So it will be a a time period, sometimes three to seven days, sometimes 14 days, where the bank's saying only people who are going to live in this property as their primary residence are allowed to purchase it. So they have excluded investors for the first X number of days or weeks. Um, For those types of properties, once you get to the end of that period, if it is a property that investors are generally going to be interested in, it often has enough market exposure that enough people are going to be interested that you're not going to be able to pick up a screaming deal because each investor is evaluating the property differently based on their required return, um, you know, the amount of work they think it needs, how much they think it could rent for. And so you have all these people doing these different calculations. And so, once you get to that point where it's out there in the open and everyone knows about it, it's not going to be the best deal. More competition at that point. Right. 
Um, so the properties that don't have that first look or owner occupancy period will be your best bets because then you have the opportunity to go in. And if you're the first one who sees it, you're the first one who can get out there and have your agent write an offer. You could potentially get it before anybody else. What else? So what are the general pros and cons that come to mind as an investor of buying foreclosed property? <sighs> well, if you're savvy enough to be a real estate investor, the cons are not uh, particularly daunting. I mean, typically it's going to be a property that's in a greater state of disrepair, right? It's in worse condition than the average house. But if you're an investor, that's not really going to deter you. Uh, if it's already at the it's been listed stage, uh, there shouldn't really be any concerns about title issues, although you'll still want to have a reputable title agent do a title search and make sure that they can issue you a title policy and uh, warrant that you have ensure that you have clear title. I will say uh, there is a lot of opportunity for buying. Well, again, not as much as there used to be, but there's still a good opportunity for buying at the foreclosure auction because you do have less competition than once it's on the market and everyone can see it. But the added risk there is that if the foreclosure was not done properly and you have not had your title agent do a search to confirm that it was done properly, you would then be inheriting all of the liens, subordinate liens, uh, those under the first mortgage that's being foreclosed on, uh, you would then inherit all of those liens and you could be in a very bad financial situation. So I just had that happen uh, two months ago, maybe there was a house that I was keeping my eye on in Midtown that was potentially a great deal. Uh, it was a foreclosure or it was a short sale. The short sale didn't work out. Property went into foreclosure and the first mortgage amount was fairly reasonable. Um, could have bid on it, paid off that whole first mortgage, got the property for a reasonable enough price that you could have fixed it up, resold it, made some decent money. But I had Hayward Title Group do a title search and they said, do not bid on this. The foreclosure was not done properly. And it's got, you know, these three or four other liens that attach to the property. So don't bid on it. Because had I bid on it, then I would have inherited all of those liens against the property. Oh. Um, I mean, significant enough, you know, I think all told they were in the 50 or $60,000 range once you added them all up. Um, so, so you do have to be careful. Always make sure you're working with a reputable title agent um, because it is possible that it gets even through the foreclosure process, gets through the foreclosure auction, gets to the market, and then you'll discover that the foreclosure wasn't done properly. I thought and that that doesn't get... That doesn't get leveled out at the auction. Hmm. Um, so then you would, the bank would have to re foreclose, go through that whole process again, name all of the correct creditors, all the people who had leaned the property. That happens on the actual foreclosure part process. If it's done properly, yeah. If it's not, then you have to go do it all over again. Well, how does the bank miss that? Uh, their attorney doesn't consider all of the, uh, potential liens that could, could attach. Do they um, see them? Do they see them, but just say, no, that, um, it's irrelevant here. So we're not going to consider it possible. Um, I'm not a title agent, so I don't know all of the intricacies of that. Um, but it can relate to uh, homestead status, marital status, things like that. So if those things change, uh, certain debts which would not have attached to the property then attach. Uh, so, so there are cases like that. So it probably like gets complicated. Yes. Uh, what else? Is that it? Well, um, I mean, you said pros and cons, and I, I listed some of them, but uh, pros are generally that you can get a property less expensively, and uh, if you are a seasoned enough, savvy enough investor to find that property and fix it up at a reasonable cost, you can create value. This is what flippers do, right? They, they find a distressed property, they fix it up, 
they add value and then they can uh, earn a profit for doing that. So that's the main advantage is that you're buying a property at below market value and being able to add value, increase the market value of the property and realize a profit once you sell it or rent it at a good rate, right? Could you burr it? Or you could burr it. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, you could burr it. So burr for our listeners is buy, rehab, what is it, all, all the R's? Uh, refinance, rent, rent. Refinance, repeat. Yeah, repeat, right. So buy, renovate, refinance, rent, repeat. Um, yeah. And I did that a lot early on in my investing career where I'd, I'd purchase the property, I'd get a loan to buy it and renovate it, create enough equity that I could refinance out all the money that I spent buying and renovating it. So essentially, I had no money invested in the property because I refinanced it all out. Ever with foreclosed property? Always. Always with foreclosed property. Yeah. Because it's probably easier to find the burrable properties. There are more burrable foreclosures than any other type of property. Yeah. All right. Burrable. Burrable. All right. Any other pros or cons? Uh, no, the big con again is just um, making sure that uh, you've done your titles. Well, yeah, but you've done your title search so you don't inherit uh, subordinate liens that are going to, you know, cripple the investment. So you just got to be on the lookout for that. And there's no seller to go and talk to and say, you know, what is the history of this house? Right. So with the house that Megan and I purchased for our new home, it had been vacant for four and a half years, bank owned for three and a half years. And the seller, because they've never occupied the property, they don't have the same legal requirement of disclosure because they haven't owned it. They haven't lived there, right? So they really can't disclose because they don't, they just don't have that knowledge. Uh, and so there's a lot of extra due diligence that you need to do to try and fill in that picture or put together the pieces of the puzzle. What's the reality To actually here? know what's the true condition of the property. That's interesting. So that does make it a little more risky. But a good home inspector is going to be able to get you, you know, 95% of the way there. So always work with a title agent. Always have a good home inspector.